All right, good morning and thank you for coming. We're gonna give you a quick briefing on an officer-involved shooting that happened here at 201 Inman Street at approximately 3 a.m. this morning. Uh, I wanna stress in the very beginning that the investigation is still in its infancy. So this information that we're giving you right now is gonna be preliminary. It's gonna be subject to change, so I want you all to keep that in mind. There's gonna be a number of questions you're gonna have that I won't answer because we're not leading the criminal investigation part of it. So if we get to that point and we have some questions that we won't answer, then that's why. So at approximately 2.58 this morning, officers were dispatched here to 201 Inman Street on multiple 911 calls about a male as a, uh, was described as going crazy up in a breezeway, knocking out a series of lights in a hallway, banging on doors, attempting to make entry into a number of apartments. Uh, several officers were dispatched because of the nature of the call uh, we do teach our officers that when they're going to a call that may possibly involve someone uh, experiencing a mental illness crisis, that they use time, distance, and cover. They got here on scene, they develop a plan, they methodically approach the breezeway, and they make contact with this subject. Officers spent an amount of time, several minutes, trying to get into a dialogue with this subject. He was in an elevated position, officers were on the ground floor and they talked to him for, like I said, several minutes. Um, at some point, an officer broke free from there and was getting information from one of the 911 callers when our subject came down the stairs and it would appear to be holding at least one frying pan, a meat cleaver, and possibly a third object, which we may, may have been a knife. Officers, again, tried to engage him in a dialogue as he was coming down stairs. They were giving him very clear, loud, verbal commands that dropped the, the items that he had in his hand, and they were backing up, again, creating some distance. At one point, when our subject gets to the bottom of the staircase, he stops, he pauses. They have a very short exchange. Officers, are, again, tell them they're trying to help him. They drop the uh, items he has in his hands, and our subject just starts on some unintelligible words he starts saying, and at one point, our officers tell them, if you don't drop what you have, we're gonna deploy a taser on you. Our officers then tried to, they deployed a, a taser one time. Initially, it looked like the taser was gonna be effective. The subject dropped to the ground, but almost immediately stood back up. Our officers then tried a second round of tasing on him, which was ineffective, and at that point, the subject charged at the officers, and in the ensuing um, altercation, we had an officer discharge his weapon and we had one officer that was stabbed in his shoulder by the suspect. Um, both the injured officer and the injured party were transported to a local hospital where the subject was uh, declared deceased and our officer was treated and then he's been admitted in stable condition. At this time, we don't think the officer's um, injuries are life-threatening, but I wanna stress to you that officers every day come to work in this profession hoping to get home, but more importantly, hoping that everybody that they interact with get home as well. And I think that played out in this um, occasion. As is common practice for us here at the Denton Police Department, the Texas Rangers are gonna be the lead in the criminal investigation. And concurrently, we're gonna be holding an internal affairs investigation by our internal affairs unit. The involved officer that fired his weapon, he is gonna be placed on administrative leave, which again is standard practice and he is um, gonna be interviewed by the Texas Rangers at some point, as well as our internal affairs. He is about a six year veteran of the uh, Denton Police Department. Our officer that was injured, he is brand new to our department, but he comes to us with well over 10 years of previous law enforcement experience. So you're not talking about uh, new officers that are out here that don't know their profession, don't know their job. So with that, I'll open up to any questions you have. Again, understanding there may be some that we won't answer because of the nature of the investigation. Can you tell us how many? How long was it between the arrival and then uh, the shooting? So there are several minutes, between five and ten minutes. Um, we're still collecting all the videos from the officers that were, were here that witnessed it, as well as the officers that are involved. It's going to take some time to download that body cam footage. And I intentionally try not to look at too much of the evidence before I get it presented to me from the Texas Rangers because we want to stay as transparent and out of that process as we can. Can you did tell us how many shots were fired? Or many? Or like people, or do we know? So we don't know at this time, we believe that he lived here in the complex. We haven't verified that yet. There's still a number of witnesses to uh, interview, 
both that witnessed the altercation and witnessed his behavior prior to our arrival. Can you tell us how many shots were fired by the officer? So there was more more than one uh, round fired, but again, I don't want to get into too many specifics because I don't know them and I don't want to speak for the Rangers. How many were called for the initial 911 call? How many officers responded? So initially we had five officers arrive on scene. We had uh, FTO, a field training officer that had a new officer with them. We also had a couple of other officers show up and then we had the other, the uh, last officer. It was attempting to gain more information as the events were unfolding. Is this student housing or are these students that live here? I think there's a mix of student and regular population here, but again, I don't want to speak on that. So right now we're we're believing that he's going to be a black male in his 20s. He has not been positively identified, and we definitely don't want to give out any information that might identify him prior to his family being uh, notified. Out of respect for them and for him. Is it true you guys went house to house, apartment to apartment, to make sure everybody was safe? And could you elaborate on that? Sure, absolutely. After the officer-involved shooting, our officers not only started performing first aid on our subject that ended up um, dying but they also did a public safety sweep of the apartment complex, especially that building right there, to make sure that people that were in the adjoining apartments uh, behind the backdrop of this were okay inside. Do you know if uh, a suspect got into any apartments that he did not live in? So right now we don't have any indication that he actually made entry into any of the apartments, but we do know that he was trying to gain entry from what we got on the 911 calls. Yeah, we haven't talked to, I, I haven't been privy to any of the interviews that we have done with any of the witnesses, but all I can tell you is that it was um, someone's going crazy in the hallway, banging on a number of doors, trying to get in. But I want to stress that this isn't just a tragedy for law enforcement. It's also a tragedy for the young man that is no longer with us. Anytime that a life is taken, no matter the circumstance, is tragic and we don't want it to happen. So we're going to be doing a detailed and thorough review of it like we do with everything else, every other critical incident that we're involved in and uh, we'll be going from there as we get information. Uh, last question for me, just kind of bigger picture, when you talk about the training that law enforcement departments are getting now with mental health, right? Um, how, how much training are you guys going into that and uh, are you seeing more calls? So, uh, you know, as you guys know, mental illness is something that affects a wide variety of our country and, and it affects everybody. There's no there's no one segment of our community that it affects, it affects everyone. Without getting into specifics, because we don't know, we don't know the history of the young man that is now deceased. We just know based on 911 calls that he may have been suffering in a mental health crisis. We don't know that yet. Our officers get the 40 hours that are required by TCOL, Texas Commission on Law Enforcement, but they also get ongoing uh, in-service training when dealing with mental illness. They get uh, de-escalation training from, in the form of ICAT, which is, you know, uh, really goes, speaks to us using time, distance, and cover when you're talking about dealing with people in crisis. But the, the training's ongoing, and we're never going to have enough. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you all very much. Appreciate it. it.